This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 11, Non-Homogeneous Linear Systems. Our objectives for this lecture are to describe the solution set of a non-homogeneous system in parametric vector form. Understand the relationship between the solutions of ax equals 0 and ax equals b for the same matrix A, and write a short proof of the statement about vectors. In the previous lecture, we saw that the solution set of a homogeneous matrix equation, which has the form ax equals 0, can be described as the span of one or more vectors. Now we want to try to use that knowledge to help us describe the solutions to the general equations that look like ax equals b. Let's take a look at this situation. Let's consider this matrix A and vector b, and let's consider the solution sets of both ax equals 0, which we studied in the previous lecture, and ax equals b. Since the coefficient matrix is the same for these two equations, we should suspect that the two solution sets should also be related. So we're going to work these problems out side by side. On the left, we have the equation ax equals 0, and on the right, we have the equation ax equals b. Notice that the first three columns of these two augmented matrices are the same, but the third columns are different. We row reduce both matrices, and we write the general solutions to both systems. Now we're going to write these solutions in parametric vector form. On the left, we have the form that we learned about in lecture 10, and on the right, we notice that we have some of the same elements, but we've got an additional vector that we have to add. So on the left, our solution is that the vector x equals x3 times the vector negative 4, negative 1, 1, and on the right, our solution vector x looks like x3 times negative 4, negative 1, 1, plus the vector 0, negative 3, 0. Notice that there's no variable multiplied by 0, negative 3, 0. That's just a static vector that's added to our previous solution. So if we compare these two solution sets, you can see them both graphed here. Both of these are lines in three dimensions, and they're connected by this vector 0, negative 3, 0. The lines are parallel, and the vector connects the two solution sets. One way to think about what's going on here is that every solution of ax equals b can be written as v plus p, where v is any solution of ax equals 0, and p is the specific solution of ax equals b. Here you see the situation drawn. So the vector in green is the solution of ax equals b, the vector in blue is the corresponding solution of ax equals 0, and p connects those two solutions. Another way to think of this is that we can construct the solution set of ax equals b using two pieces. The first piece is the full solution set of ax equals 0, which we learned about in the previous lecture, and the second piece is any one particular solution of ax equals b. We're using the word solution a lot, so it's worth taking a second to make sure that we understand the definition of that word. A vector u is a solution of a matrix equation ax equals b if au equals b. In other words, if we replace the x in our equation with the vector u, the left-hand side equals the right-hand side, that the equation is true when we make that substitution. This theorem makes the connection that we saw in the previous example official. The theorem says that if you've got an m by n matrix and a vector b, and you have a specific solution of ax equals b, just any one solution of that equation, that the solution set of ax equals b is the set of all vectors that have the form v plus p, where v is the solution of ax equals 0, and p is that specific solution of ax equals b that we had. We can illustrate this here. This says that if u is any solution of ax equals b, then u has the form v plus p, where v is a solution of ax equals 0, and p is that given solution of ax equals b. The theorem also says that if u happens to be v plus p, where v is a solution of ax equals 0 and p is that given solution of ax equals b, then u is a solution of ax equals b. So to prove our characterization theorem, we would have to prove both of these statements. We have to prove that if u is a solution of ax equals b, then u has the form v plus p, and if u has the form v plus p, then u is a solution of ax equals b. Let's walk through the steps of this proof. For the first part, we start with u being a solution of ax equals b, and remember that that means that a times u equals b. So now our goal is to show that u has the form v plus p, where v is a solution of ax equals 0, and p is that specific solution of ax equals b that we were given. So what should v be to make that work? If u has to equal v plus p, what should v equal? Well, v would have to equal u minus p. So why is v a solution of ax equals 0? What would it mean for v to be a solution of ax equals 0? Well, we would have to investigate what happens when we multiply a times v. Do we get 0? Well, let's find out. When we multiply a times v, 
the first thing that we can do is replace v by what it's equal to, which is u minus p. Then we can use our distributive law to rewrite a times the quantity u minus p as a u minus a p. a u we are given as b. a p we are given as also b, because remember p is a solution of a x equals b. And then b minus b equals 0, and that shows that a v equals 0, which means that v is a solution of a x equals 0. And now u has the form v plus p, where v is a solution of a x equals 0, and that's what we wanted in this direction of the proof. Now going the other direction, we're given that u has the form v plus p, where v is a solution of a x equals 0, and this time our goal is to show that u is a solution of a x equals b. How would we show that? Well, again, what we would need to show is what happens when we multiply a times u. And so we have a similar calculation here, where when we multiply a times u, we start by substituting u equals v plus p. Then we use our distributive rule. We know that a v equals 0, because v is a solution of ax equals 0. As before, we know that a p equals b, and then 0 plus b equals b. And since a u equals b, that shows that u is a solution of ax equals b. This theorem tells us that if we know all the solutions of ax equals 0, and we learned how to figure that out in the previous lecture, then all we need to know is just one solution of ax equals b to figure out all the solutions of ax equals b. But it's important to note that even though ax equals 0 always has at least one solution, namely x equals 0, it's possible for ax equals b to not have any solutions. So for this theorem to work, we have to have at least one solution of ax equals b to bridge the gap between the solution set of ax equals 0 and the solution set of ax equals b. So if ax equals b is an inconsistent equation, if that equation has no solutions, then this theorem doesn't apply, it doesn't work. Now the theorem also illustrates a general thing that we're going to be doing a lot in this course, which is proving properties about vectors. For right now, we're going to focus on properties that have the form if vector v has property x, whatever that is, then v has property y. The basic structure of what that proof would look like is listed here. We start by saying, let v be a vector with property x. And then we have to think about what does that property actually tell us about v? Using our definitions, using our knowledge of the language of linear algebra, what does that actually tell us about the vector v? And then we think about what we would have to do to show that v has property y. What would we have to demonstrate? What would we have to show to show that v has property y? And then we do that. We write out those steps explaining that property. So here's an example. Let's say we have an m by n matrix, and w is a vector in Rn. We want to prove that if w is a solution of ax equals 0 and c is a scalar, then cw is also a solution of ax equals 0. So we start by writing, let w be a solution of ax equals 0. And then again, we remember that definition of the word solution. What does that mean? What does it mean for w to be a solution of ax equals 0? Well, it means that a times w equals 0. If we substitute w in for the x, the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Now we have to think about our goal. How are we going to show that cw is a solution of ax equals 0? Well, we would have to figure out what a times cw is. And now we can use a compatibility property. We can move that scalar out and write that as c times the quantity aw. We know that aw is 0, so we can do that substitution. And then it doesn't matter what that scalar c is, c times the 0 vector equals the 0 vector. And now we've shown that a times cw is 0, so that means that cw is a solution of ax equals 0. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.